questions, uh, mostly about sexuality. So we have some 15 minutes for the first presentation. Irene Delval. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, yeah. Oh. Thank you, Yarka. Um, thank you very much to everybody. Good afternoon. Boa tarde. Boa sta uh, buenas tardes. Uh, thank you very much for being here in this traveling experience, tra time traveling experience. It's a great pleasure to be here today because I know the difficulties for organizing this meeting. So finally it's happening. So I'm very glad that it's occurring. And I am the first one in this session uh, about behavior, um, sexual behavior, and the second thematic se session of the Congress. My name is Irene Delval. I'm from Spain, but I'm, uh, I, I have been in Brazil for more than 10 years now. I did my master's and my PhD here, and now I am a postdoctoral fellow in Jarka's lab. So I'm going to show you a small piece of our work there in, in Jarka's lab of my, of my postdoctoral project. So today I'm going to present to you a case of homosexual courtship in wild capuchin monkeys. So I, I like to start talking a little bit about homosexual behavior in animals. It's a topic of great inter interest in the biological sciences, of course, uh, uh, but uh, it has been, for a very long time, it has been obs obscured or um, not shown because of moral or religious issues. First, the first records of homosexual behavior in animals was not reported because people thought that they were possessed by devil or, or things like that. So it wasn't uh, an in, uh, a topic of interest at the beginning, but now it, of course it is. Uh, but however, for many reasons, it's often considered as well as a Darwinian paradox since selection might act against traits that are not enhancing reproduction. But we don't know if that's really true because this trait, not because, but this trait, the fact is that it is ubiquitous, not, not this trait, this behavior is ubiquitous in the animal kingdom. We can find it in more than 1,500 species now, going from insects to, uh, to, to birds or, of course, mammals, reptiles, etc. So it's all over the animal kingdom. We can see it everywhere. Uh, so we have to explain it and think about it. I, I always like to explain that when we talk about homosexual behavior in animals, we, don't, we are not talking about homosexuality because this word, it involves another concepts, different concepts, and more, mm, more permanent tendencies that we, don't, we cannot ask to animals, we cannot uh, post in animals, so we prefer to use homosexual behavior or the, word, the, the expression we, you, we usually use when we refer to homosexual behavior in animals is same-sex sexual behavior, which is the term that I'm going to use uh, through this presentation. In primates, same-sex sexual behavior has been documented in most species. Uh, today, in more than 51 species have been reported, including prosimians, monkeys, and, and apes. Uh, at the beginning, prosimians were not reported to have uh, to, to perform same-sex sexual behavior, but today there are lots of records of prosimians performing same-sex sexual behavior. So it's not a philo it was there was a phylogenetical explanation about that that it's not uh, posted anymore. So, but the f another important fact is there is a huge intra and interspecific variation in the frequencies and in the forms this behavior takes place in different species. So we can find different uh, functional explanations for this behavior according to the species or to the age of the individuals. So for instance, uh, which is the bottom here? Uh, the, the typical form of same-sex sexual behavior in Japanese macaques is ventroventral mounts among f adult females. While in bonobos, you know bonobos, they are famous for their rich uh, sexual behavior, and you can see, you you can see it's frequent in every age class and more frequent ventral mounts, and there are many other different uh, same-sex sexual interaction according to the species and many different explanations. 
in capuchin monkeys, which is the species that we study here. If you have seen the symposia this morning of Patricia, Briseida, and Nicola, we, we, I study the same monkeys they study. Uh, so in, same, uh, in capuchin monkeys, same-sex sexual behavior is typical from juvenile's play. It's, uh, they, they perform a lot of, of ventral mounts during play, uh, common among, among males, and it's often ex uh, explained by the need of practice hypothesis, which suppose that, that uh, young individuals need to practice for further uh, heterosexual um, performance. However, same-sex courtship, which is not just a mount, a sequence of mounts, uh, has never been documented in this species. So today, I'm going to show to you, this is a small piece of my postdoctoral research, the first report of same sexual behavior in capuchin monkeys that includes a complete courtship display. Uh, this is an outstanding fact because this behavior has never been reported in, in capuchin males and also because one of those individuals is very, very young. He's 18 months old and he is still nursed by his mother. So uh, this, is, this gives more relevance to this, to this uh, record. But before showing, to, I'm going to show to you a small part of this record, which consists in a 15-minute uh, uninterrupted sequence of sex and love. But I would like to introduce to you uh, the courtship display, because it's very interesting, the courtship display in capuchin monkeys. They are known, they, they have been named as erotic artists, because they perform a really extravagant and, uh, I, I don't know, um, Diamative uh, sequence of behaviors. So, and, and they have been already um, really well studied. Uh, I like to point out, for, for instance, that this, this draw from the first treat of natural history, the first long treatment of natural history, uh, represents the typical specimen of, this, of the capuchin monkeys uh, with a prosthetic, prosthet I, opa, I'm sorry. Proceptive female. You know, this is the typical phase of the proceptive female calling attention of the male that Briseida called that she said that they were sticky. So these are some representative uh, behaviors of this uh, of this species courtship behavior. The female uh, uh, it has four. Four faces, and the female begins solicitation male's attention, and then the male goes into the courtship and responds, but it, it takes a, a while for doing that. Then eventually it's mating, and sometimes, not always, it's a, it's, uh, it occurs a post copulatory display. These behaviors have already been published and, and described, and they are in literature, but only for captive capuchin monkeys. Um, from the species Sapayus uh, apella. So, here I'm going to show to you, here, I don't know if it's going to work, a, a brief piece of my record of this uh, homosexual courtship. And you are going to see Pimenta and Dumbo. I don't know if it works. <laughs> ah, but you cannot listen. But this, this are Pimenta and Dumbo. Uh, performing most of the of the behaviors we we have record for well, this is this is a spoiler from the regular typical heterosexual courts. So what we did is taking this cetogram from from the literature and apply it to our observation to independent trinet observers, analyze the video, applying the the cetogram, and we transcribe it. Uh, with uh, a specific so software, it's used for behavioral. Behavioral analysis is the observer. So here, you can see the, there, is a, the, there is one that is a, a subadult sub male, and there is the other one, Pimenta, which is 18 months old. Look, he's making the typical female face, like m m opening his mouth. Well, this is a, it's a very short sample, but this is a very interesting record. So what we found 
is that the two monkeys performed 16 out of the 20 typical behaviors of the heterosexual courtship, and that it was similar to the second phase of, uh, of the courtship, the mutual courtship phase. There were four behaviors that are typical from the heterosexual courtship that they, were, they did not perform, and there were also four, no four novel behaviors that we will a further study since we need to know if they are typical from young individuals or, or, or they are typical from this species since this is a different species from the one that it's uh, re uh, reported in literature. So there are th things to, to understand. And some topics from discussion about this fact is why this, this two, these two young males are performing this uh, homosexual courtship. It's very interesting. Uh, because they are not both, but the youngest one is outside of the, of the hormonal uh, triggers that, that give the starting point for sexual behavior. So it's, it's very interesting, and uh, we have this, this discussion, it's opening questions that we need further research. Is it, is it a rehearsal or it has another function? What we know, it's a powerful way of uh, communicating social messages, so, so we, we suppose, I suppose that this is not a, a practice, no, 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 sorry. Uh, we are posing, supposing that this is not practice because this, this is the first time this behavior is recorded and reported. And I've been on the field for um, uh, years and I have, uh, I have already analyzed hours and hours of video, t of video records. And this is the only record of courtship behavior. So if it's, uh, if it's a practice, uh, Behavior. Why is not everywhere and every day uh, among among young individuals? If they need to practice it, it must be more 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 frequent, right? So it has some contributions. This this record has some contrib contributions to do. That is, it's the first report concerning wild robust capuchins, and it's the first description of, cor of courtship among two males. The first courtship among immature individuals. And now I would like to make a little bit of propaganda of my own project in order that you know what we are doing now here. And so my big, my, my postdoctoral project is about the development of sexual behavior in wild, robust, robust capuchin monkeys. And this is the result of the, of the collaboration on these two wonderful women, which are, are Patricia Isar and Jaroslava Varela Valentova, and the, the collaboration of these two labs, my former lab, Ladies, which, uh, in which they, we used and they actually uh, continue to try to understand developmental issues and, uh, and social interaction of capuchin monkeys and other, and other animal species. They study also uh, domestic dogs and the contribution of Yarka with her lab of evolution behavior and sexuality. So by, the, by the, this bridges this, this collaboration, we are creating a new era of research, which is primate sexuality, uh, uh, primate sexual behavior in the University of Sao Paulo. So our main goals, we want to understand when does sexuality, the sexual behavior begin? It, there are many, many possibilities it, it can, in capuchin monkeys, of course, I'm talking about capuchin monkeys, it can occur uh, just after birth or only in adolescence. We want to know also which are the first sexual behavior, it, it are, there are many, and which are the first preferred sexual partner, partners, and if this changes along, along development, because it's not, this is, of course, you are acquiring proficiency and everything changes, which are also the first sexual context, and also, if there are any intersexual difference, we expect that there, there is not going to be the same thing for females and for males because uh, sexual conflict and many, many different, many, many factors. And also, since, uh, as I'm going to explain for, uh, next, uh, we are studying two different species, we want to know if there are ecological difference. So, uh, we do that uh, by studying these two species Sapaius libidinosus and Sapaius antusternus. One of them, Chantusternus, is critically endangered species. They, they inhabit two very different habitats in Brazil. They are the, both endemic from Brazil. Uh, one of them inhabits, as Patricia said this morning, uh, a semi harid uh, in, in the north of Brazil, in this region here. 
and the other one, Sabayushanto Sternus, lives in the Atlantic Forest. It's a very different area. It's close to Amazon. Okay, I'm finishing. I'm sorry, I'm almost over time. So what we do uh, is that we record every week. We go to the field and we film the individuals. Uh, we have focal sampling, focal animal sampling videos from the first week of life of these individuals, and we have a, 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 stor a opa, storage them in a, in a database which is available for new students. So we do that. We have for this project we have co uh, selected 16 individuals, well, we, but we have many more, and we are going to study the third, the, the first three years of life. That, that's not important. And then this is a very high demanding task because we have to collect the, da the data. I've been on the field for almost two years collecting data. Then we have to classify data, transcribe the data, and of course analyze the data. So we need people, and we want we invite people to write to me um, in order to acquire to to. Obtain to give response to, to some of these questions. We want to, in, res in resume, I would like to say that we want to know what is sexual behavior and improve its definition because it is not limited to mounts and genital contact. There are, there are a lot of details that we want to understand. We want to understand when does sexuality begin, and we can study this in a, in a primate species, far from taboos and things like that that occur with, with children, so we can understand which are the first sexual partners without thinking about different difficult stuff, like pedophilia. We want to understand what other functions sex, sex has in other species, and we also, I would also like to highlight that same-sex sexual behavior may enhance fitness because it's, uh, it has a, a very uh, important function in social communication. So please never forget, we are all primates and then comparative approach is very important for understanding our, our own behavior. And also I need to th the thanks to the, the foundings founders because without that, without FAPES, PICAPES, at least it's not possible to perform this, this high, high demanding task and, and research. And thank you very much to you all here for being here, for listening to me, and to the organizers for, for letting me present my, my work. Thank you very much. Thank you, Irene. Very nice presentation. Are there questions, comments, suggestions? Thank you. That was a really nice presentation. Thank you. And uh, I want to take you back to your questions because, you know, uh, you suggest that um, the last uh, slide that uh, sexual behavior was about communication and love? <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe that's, yeah. Not only for that, but it, it's, it's but used. But can you expand on used, that idea? It's I love used it. for that. <laughs> well, uh, that's uh, maybe, I need to prove that. Maybe it's an insight I have that I, because I see it so frequently in, in nature. So uh, that I that I see uh, I see those those individuals so exciting that I I, can, I I I need to analyze that I I I see that like uh, an expression of love their excitement and of course it has many many f social functions and communication since it communicates behavioral states there there are the dominance hypotheses when someone mounts the other one but I really do believe that they are when they are performing sexual behavior among individuals like these ones here they know each other well they are connected and they are in through a sexual interaction which is about taking care of, of both of them but I, I don't I don't have a clear explanation for that. Thank you. Other question? Last question. Uh, first, congratulations to your work. It's oh, very nice. You. 
yeah, I would like to uh, ask you if you find, if you saw, if you see, I, I can't uh, uh, to speak now, uh, a female female interaction. And one question, female female interaction. And second, why, do you, why did you think it's so uh, rare? Why did you, you didn't observe more? No, you, in the beginning, you showed you found this uh, homosexual behavior in 51 species. Né? And uh, you only present this case. Now, why is it so rare? Yeah, thank you very much. It's a, a good question about females. I've never recorded female female interaction. In, I have been in the field for, as I said, for a year and a half, and never a record and ne neither see female-female interaction, young female-female interaction, because my focus has always been young individuals. So I, I have records and I have been watching uh, juvenile males and females, never record female-female interaction. I don't know why. I have seen adult females performing some sort of uh, not sexual, but that's the question for in, uh, improving the definition. Some kind of behaviors that can be part of courtship behaviors, like uh, touching each other, each other breasts and things like that, that are considered when they are within the sexual interaction, within courtship, they are considered li like sexual. But, but it's, it's not, I have never seen Robin, for instance, that, as we've seen in one of us, for instance. Mm, but uh, 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 about the other, the other part, it's so rare, which is rare, it's the courtship behavior. Courtship is a very patterned display, as it has never been recorded. Uh, same sexual mounts are all over. Males are all the time mounting each other. They, the Capuchin juveniles play, it, it consists in rough and tumble play, and then it ends in a mount. But it's very different because there are two individuals playing and then uh, a mount and then another one gets in and it's very quick and it's a, a very different stuff. This uh, courtship behavior, it's similar what, uh, to the courtship behavior of adult male and female and it has never been recorded for two, two individuals pertaining to the same sex, neither adults or immature individuals. So the particularity is the courtship behavior, which is different and which is rare because same sex interactions like take, uh, looking at each other's genitalia or, or, mounting, or mounting, it's very common. Did I answer? <laughs> okay. Something else? Okay. So, thank you very much again for a nice presentation. And we will go for the next one. Who is next? Lucas. Lucas. Where is Lucas? Lucas is there. <laughs> so, our next... Pre oh. can, can you find him? Is it here? So next, uh, next short communication has a very interesting title, The Sociosexuality Explained, so I'm really, uh, I really want to see that. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, and the presenter is Lucas Schirmer, who is a student from the Catholic University in Rio de Janeiro. So it's your turn. Uh, hi, thank you everyone for your attention here. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organization for the opportunity to talk to you today. My name is Lucas, I'm a graduate student in psychology at puc -Hiu. And I'll be presenting to you today some data that we collected on our study on social sexuality and Tinder behavior. So we call this study the social sexuality explained, 
what the gender and targeted relationships on Tinder reveal about sexual commitment. <clears throat> First, I'll be talking to you a little bit about our background theory. I'll be talking a little bit about parental investment theory. Uh, it is a theory that basically explains that most animals, species that we study, when offspring is newborns, they need to be taken care of, uh, primarily by the father and mother of the, this newborn child or any other animal. So we, we might think that both parents need to invest resources in the taking care of this child, but gender plays a, a big role in what kind of investments are going to be uh, displayed. So most mammalian species and humans are no different. We might think that uh, women need to expend more direct resources uh, in taking care of newborns and their offspring because they, they have to take care of the, the, the offspring on their belly for a really long period of time. They have to breastfeed. They have to spend a lot of resources. Okay. And they, uh, on the other side, males, they, they need to spend resources as well in order to their offspring to thrive. But these resources are mostly indirect resources. They're not direct. So we might think someone might invest in getting relationships uh, in, in a group setting or in, in providing food for their offspring later on. But we really need to think of these two different aspects of direct and indirect resources that are explained. And also I'd like to talk a little bit about social sexuality. Uh, we can think of social sexuality as a psychological construct in, in which we think of individual difference in the willingness to engage in sex, sexual relationships, sexual behavior, in outside the boundaries of a committed relationship. Individuals vary on this degree, as I will explain more later. But for now, that's, that's what you need to know. And online dating apps. The most worldwide used online dating app is Tinder. That's why we chose it for this research. And people use these dating apps for different purposes, different reasons. Uh, but their behavior reflects what uh, our theory engaged. So the first objective of the study was to verify gender difference in what is sought for on Tinder. And the second objective was to test the interaction between gender, the kind of relationships, and the levels of social sexuality. And for this, this study, we collected data from an online survey that contained the social sexuality ori orientation inventory revised scale, the Brazilian version, which is the most used scale to access social sexuality. This is a nine item scale with a three factor structure underlying it. So we think about social sexual behavior, attitudes and desire. And also we have a lot of questions about how people use Tinder. Uh, people might use Tinder for search for casual relationships, for committed relationships, for friendships. They might use it just because they are bored. Uh, it doesn't matter. But we, we asked people uh, why they, they were using and how they were using this, this app. Uh, again, here you can see the normal distribution of social sexuality, where in one side of the distribution, people are more restricted to engaging in sexual behavior outside the boundaries of uh, committed relationships. And on the other side, we can see people who are less restricted. 
participated in our study 2010 adults. 53.3% of them uh, were women with an average age of 23.2 years old. In this research, we, we only utilize people who consider themselves either male or female and who were heterosexual. So the results. Just a minute, please. Okay, okay here. So, <laughs> okay, so technical problems here. Okay, now we're back. Much better. So, first of all, in, in order to fulfill our first objective, which was to, again, uh, verify gender difference in what was sought on Tinder, we asked people if they were using Tinder to uh, search for casual relationships, committed relationships, or friendship. And we realized the key square test. And as you can see here on the first table, it was deemed significant for 95% confidence. And on the second table, you can see the effect size. It was 0.17. And it's considered a small to, to moderate effect size. But as I said earlier, it's statistically significant. So it's a, it's a positive result in this direction. And we can see that for, when searching for casual relationships, men are much more willing than women. But on, on the other side, when searching for committed relationships or friendships, then women are, are more represented than men. We see this different pat pattern here. Now I'm going to show you three, three graphs that uh, show the different average level of social sexuality for men and women on, on these three kind of relationships they were searching. So casual relationships, committed relationships, or friendship. I will not talk too much about friendship because due to lack of data, not many people said they were using Tinder to search for new friendships. So I will focus my analysis here on casual relationships and committed. Uh, here is the soy uh, behavior factor. And as you can see, the, the mean score for males on casual relationships was significantly higher than women. But there was no statistical difference on the committed side of the spectrum. Next, we can see the attitudes aspect. And here we can see the same pattern. So when looking for casual relationships, men score higher than women but not when searching for committed relationships. And last but not least, when looking for the desire aspect, we can see that, again, men scored significantly higher than women when they were searching for casual relationships on Tinder, but not when they were searching for committed relationships. And what we can conclude for this data that I presented to you. So, first, the, the parental investment role. We might think that gender difference regarding the differential parental investment styles, as I, was, as I was saying earlier, they impact the motives for people who use these apps. And the second conclusion is that we, we might understand social sexuality better by looking at both gender of the person, but as well as what kind of relationships they are trying to, to search. And that's all I, I got for you today. Now, thank you everyone for your attention and if you have any questions, I will be glad to answer them.
Any questions? Suggestion? Timon? Hello, Luca. Thank you very much for your presentation. I, it was just a, a wonder um, about your recruiting. You send a questionnaire. And I, I wonder if you had a, a special way to recruit people, if you targeted special medias to, to find people who were using Tinder in particular. Uh, thank you for your question. So uh, this, que this questionnaire, we, we used uh, an internet collection method of data collection. Uh, we did not use specific uh, search methods for searching for these people. This might explain why we didn't have too many people who said they were homosexual, for example, that might use other dating apps, not Tinder necessarily. But it's a, it's a good point. Thank you. Lucas, uh, your participants could choose the two options. They were looking for casual relationships and committed ones, and you have analyzed this? Yeah, they, they could choose uh, if they were seeking for casual relationships, committed relationships, or if they were looking for friendships to make new friends. But as I said earlier, uh, not too many people said they were searching for new friends. So that's why I, I did not speak too much of this, this aspect. Ah, they, they could cho choose both, no. No. No, no, not in this study. Thank you. Lucas, I was wondering um, if, two questions, if, if do you intend, uh, Jean and you, to to amplify your sample, like focusing in much more like homosexual, and actually you are talking about gender, but I think you are just considering male and female. So uh, maybe there is a huge discussion in our area about sex and gender. And so I think we need to amplify and search for, uh, to re uh, recruit much better our samples. Uh, afterwards, I was wondering, uh, and I'm very curious, curious about, did you control for age in your study? Okay, first about the sampling. Uh, yes, that's a, that's a fine question. It's very important for we to to search for people who are not this normative, like uh, men and women, heterosexual. Um, sometimes it's difficult to get to these people. Uh, we could make new studies in this direction. Now we're not doing it right now, but maybe in the future, mm -hmm. and it might produce interesting results. And about the uh, controlling for age, uh, in this graph that I present to you, I was not controlling for age, but it might bring some, some new insights because certainly age affects how people choose their mates and what they, they value more, which traits they value or, or devalue. And there are a lot of apps, so there, there is Bumble, that are, there are a lot of kind, different filters and maybe you can uh, deep your, your demographics, do you know? Tinder is, I don't know, I think it's worse than Bumble. It's what, worse just, than what? Just one idea. <laughs> <laughs> just one. Yeah, for sure. All these experiences. Uh, thank you very much. And <laughs> And we will go for the next, oh, is it me? Thank you. Muito interessante. Obrigada. Você é o último, Bruno?
depois a gente faz. So we will continue. Uh, my name is Jaroslava, or everybody is calling me here Jarka, so that, that was me. But my real name is Jaroslava um, from the Czech Republic, but I work here at the Institute of Psychology, the de Department of Experimental Psychology. And I'm actually really happy to have all of you over here. So thank you again for your presence. And I will be uh, talking just a little bit about appearance modifications, which is now recently one of my favorite topics. And I will try to be fast because there is lots of things that I might talk and I would spend hours on this topic. So, okay. Not working. Right. Yeah, not even the organization can do that. Yeah, the technical part. So let's start again. So appearance modifications. So probably everybody uh, modified their appearance somehow today already probably many times uh, since you woke up. So it is something that we normally do in everyday lives. Uh, why people change their appearance, that's actually the topic that I want to discuss with you today. Uh, it is actually very interesting because there is a high frequency of, um, uh, of people who are not really satisfied with their appearance and that's why they might be trying to change their, how they look. Uh, but there might be also other functions and I will go through them actually quickly. It's interesting that most of the research, even mine own actually, when I was studying facial appearance and attractiveness, we were usually uh, focusing on, uh, on morphology and we were actually eliminating any kind of uh, sociocultural uh, appearance modifications. But um, actually we have never been really a naked ape, right? So. It is interesting to see how people are working with their own appearance and trying to change their appearance and why. <clears throat> and there are many functions and I will mention uh, just I think that's because it's the last session, right? So the batteries are already over. <laughs> But anyway, so there are uh, several modifications, several functions of modification, such as uh, attracting of potential partners. That's usually the first one that pops up in the mind of people who are thinking about why people are actually trying to look better. So they would attract someone who is actually more attractive or uh, of higher mate value. And that definitely uh, happens in many different ways in uh, each culture, probably differently. 
But there is also the side of intrasexual competition, which used to be overlooked in this, uh, in this uh, kind of research or reasoning. Uh, we, also, we don't want to only attract attention of potential partners, but we all also want to beat our uh, rivals so that we would look better than those who uh, might be actually attracting, uh, attracting attention of the same uh, potential partners. There might be many uh, explanations for this, such as, uh, such as good genes. Uh, it might be also Fisherian selection, so it can be like really random uh, fashion. Uh, but it can be also sensory exploitation. We might like things that actually are not, uh, that didn't really evolve to, to attract uh, partners. Um, there might be also super normal stimuli that are actually attracting attention because they are simply more uh, than natural. Other, uh, other theories would, uh, would probably say that, uh, that uh, the social mimicking is uh, actually very important. It doesn't really matter if you are in Brazil or in Korea or in other, other country, but mimicking the, the models, the, the successful um, individuals might uh, have some social and evolutionary value. So changing their appearance as this nice example, one of those two guys is the original uh, Korean pop star. The other one spent millions uh, of pounds to look like the pop star. And yeah, well, that's what people sometimes do just to look differently and better, in, at least in their eyes. But of course, there are others, other, other reasons or other functions why people are changing their appearance, such as social affiliation or group affiliation. Uh, by changing our appearance, we can easily show to which group uh, we belong and to which group we don't belong. So on this example, like around here, which I, of course, can't, they can't do, no? Uh, anyway, uh, we would see probably easily who is the fan of uh, Brazilian football and who is the fan of the Czech football, just looking at the crowd, right? So people are actually changing, or we would know exactly who is the punker and who is the policeman, and also what are their roles in their society, so it's actually, Right? That people are not only showing their affiliation, but also the roles in their, um, in their lives and in the society. By changing appearance, people are also advertising their status, so they can show if they are of higher or lower social status. Again, all this depends on the local traditions and local environments and conditions. But the mechanism behind those right, changes is basically the same. Uh, of course, we are also changing appearance only during specific uh, time periods. Uh, for example, during weddings, right? People dress during a wedding ritual totally differently, and they would never use the same dress or, or makeup or shoes um, as during this day, in any other day during their lives, or when they are uh, reaching maturity when they are uh, actually trying to get out of the world of children or infants or super adults and they are actually entering the world of, that, of adult people or when we are gaining a degree uh, we also well, or in many cultures not everywhere probably we are doing some kind of ritual such as in Prague where we were even promising something in Latin we, nobody knows what we were promising or uh, this small guy who is actually waiting for uh, circumcision in Turkey uh, also is dressing very specifically and only will be dressed like that during, during this ritual. Of course, there are other functions, right, such as protection and camouflage. And mostly uh, when zoologists or uh, researchers who study non-human animals uh, talk about uh, talk about appearance modifications. Mostly, they are actually talking about this kind of functions, um, right? So, but in in people, it, these these changes, such as clothes or using shoes, uh, can also have many uh, practical functions, such as thermoregulation or or um, protection against parasites or uh, against sun, for example. 
Appearance modifications are also important as a part of self-grooming. So people are actually uh, touching themselves and other individuals, sometimes with needles, knives, and this kind of uh, quite threatening object. So actually you need to trust the other person. So it is strengthening the social bond with the other person who is, for example, doing the tattoo or other, uh, or other uh, modification. So, uh, it, right, one of these, uh, one of the functions can be social bonding and maintenance of social bonds. Of course, sometimes people go over the healthy limits and uh, they, they change their appearance too much. They spend lots of money, energy, uh, and sometimes even their whole lives changing their appearance so that they would appear like completely differently, sometimes even as a basically different species. Virtual changes of appearance are still rarely studied, but of course, nowadays, it's probably the most uh, practiced uh, appearance change, so we still have lots of uh, things to learn, actually, with, with all these additions or picture additions, what we do, what people do, why they do that, if it is appreciated by, by others or not. And sometimes, some studies even show that actually it is not as much appreciated by others than, uh, than we think. I based myself basically, basically on an a uh, review article about, uh, about appearance enhancement by Ennoski and Davis. And they were talking about many different kinds of uh, appearance modifications by tanning, by makeup, by hairstyling, by tattoos, uh, even exercises, uh, piercings, uh, depilation, right? Many, many things that actually come to our mind when we are thinking about, uh, about appearance modification. However, we thought that there was something missing in their model or in their review of the literature. And they were actually talking about visual appearance enhancement. And we thought that this is actually only part of the whole picture and we suggested that visual appearance enhancement is actually part of self-presentation enhancement in general. Sometimes we are not only enhancing or improving our appearance when we are doing this appearance modification. We can, uh, by applying cosmetics, for example, we are also improving our olfactory uh, presentation, right? So, or tactile uh, presentation, right? When we are, uh, for example, depilating uh, legs or other parts of the body, actually it feels differently when we touch the person. It, it's not even visible sometimes. So we suggested uh, a more um, broader uh, model of self-presentation enhancement that might be actually interesting to study um, in this perspective of, uh, of uh, evolutionary and social functions. When we think about it uh, in a broader sense, then we can see also other species who are actually doing lots of appearance modifications, such as this beautiful orchid bee, who is collecting lots of fragrances, and in the mating season, it's actually applying these fragran fragrances on own body to attract, uh, to attract other uh, individuals, which is a beautiful uh, modification, but it's not really appearance modification, it's Right, it's olfactory um, self-presentation modification, and to make it more even more complete, uh, this model or this picture of appearance modifications, we suggest that actually sometimes individuals do not want to improve their appearance. Sometimes they can change their appearance to look worse. Why would they do that? Why would people want to? look worse, but sometimes actually they do. They want to scare off other people or they want to blend in, right? They don't want to always appear, we don't want to always appear beautiful and attractive because that might be too much. We don't want to always attract all the attention of all the world. So sometimes people just want to blend in uh, with the crowd. And sometimes uh, parts of many rituals is actually scaring well, sometimes scaring the children, right, uh, or other people, exactly not to attack, for example, to prevent some kind of conflict or war. And yeah, 
That's uh, probably it, just to show you that not always we are actually enhancing our appearance. Sometimes we actually want to look really, really bad. Thank you very much. If you want to ask something, you can. I think we have space like for one question. And I go. <laughs> I was just wondering if you would give any examples of what hypotheses you might have for when you would dress to impress versus to make people feel averse towards you. Like, what would be some examples? What would be examples of worsening? Yeah. Are you t yeah. Maybe some, one day you do want to look nice, and other days you don't want to look nice. What type of, you know, if it's, if it's a frequent enough thing, you might be able to predict when you would go for one versus the other. That's actually a very good question, right? This is a theoretical model, which we were trying actually to, complete, to, to show the complete picture, right, of appearance modifications, but we don't have any data on worsening of own appearance. There is no research about it. What, what uh, we know, for example, that the detection of ugliness or non-attractiveness is much more, much quicker and even more universal than uh, detection of attractiveness, huh. right? So this is actually interesting, but we don't really have data on why, when, under which conditions people are changing their appearance for worse. I was thinking right. something like, you know, to avoid harassment from the opposite sex. Yes, sects yes, yes. Can be, it can be uh, avoiding, avoidance of uh, harassment, which actually it appears also frequently in models, right, or in people who are really highly attractive, that they are actually trying to really blend in. Otherwise, they would be, uh, right, pursued all the time by... Uh, potential sexual partners, unwanted sexual yeah. partners. But um, it can be also um, like revolt against the society, right? Against the patterns of society. I mean, everybody is telling me that I should look beautiful, so I won't, right? Which was exactly uh, the movement of punk, for example, but many others, like in uh, in uh, rock uh, bands, uh, there were actually many, uh, specifically female or girl rock bands, uh, actually worsening their appearance, showing that we would go against the crowd, right? So it can also have this aspect of going going against. I'm wondering if one category that might have been missing, I'm not sure, is... In rituals, you modify your appearance to play a symbolic, a particular symbolic role in a ritual. So would that be, that didn't seem to be in your scheme, but, but maybe it was the symbolic use of, of appearance modification in playing a particular role in a particular kind of ritual, for example. Yeah, that's, that's quite possible, actually. We should, <laughs> to complete it, right, we should include a timeline. Because sometimes some tendencies are probably more stable during lifetime, but some are really punctual. And so that would be really interesting, right? What people, but, but actually we did one study specifically about makeup usage in women. And we were asking them in which situation they use makeup more than normally. So when you go out with male friends, with female friends, when you go for a first date with someone, when you go to an um, interview with a boss, and things like that. But actually, we didn't find much uh, individual differences in, in makeup usage. What we actually found was that some women were using more makeup than others, and it didn't really matter which, which situations. But of course, this is makeup usage. This can be different than, like, I don't know, using some specific costumes, which are really very, very specific for some situation, for some ritual. Yeah, that would be actually interesting to see if there are some, some patterns, right, for some, like, specific social, uh, or rituals which have specific social roles. Yeah, like the hunter-gatherers I work with have these special rituals and special costumes that go with each one. And then various 
take on those roles and dress up in the particular creatures that play a role in the ritual and things like that. Yeah, yeah. This is actually very interesting because there is lots of rituals where the people are actually pretending they are other species, for example, right? right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I think that's it. Thank you for the discussion and we will be discussing more during the cocktail. And we have the last presentation. Bruno. Who is Bruno? And uh, he's from our, he's actually a PhD student uh, from my lab, from our department at the um, uh, experimental psychology here at University of Sao Paulo. And nothing. Hello, good afternoon. Um, so my name is Bruno. It's a huge pleasure to be here presenting my PhD project for you. This is actually my first presentation at a Congress and it's especially amazing because it's an international one. So yes, it's a huge pleasure to be here. As Yarka was saying, I am her newest PhD student and my project is still at a very preliminary level, but it will be a pleasure to share it with you. So the title of my project is Different Types of Male Homosexuality Tested Through Different Biomarkers and Psychosocial Sexual Aspects. It's a little bit long, but we'll get through every part of it. So the first thing I would like to talk about is sexual, sexual orientation. We consider sexual orientation to be um, a, phenomen a phenomenon that um, directs an individual's attraction, sexual attraction, uh, that directs an individual's sexual attraction based on the, an appearance of other individuals that um, sends signals of an apparent ident sexual identity. So usually people feel more attracted to men or women or both. Um, this phenomenon can be broken down into four different concepts. The first one would be sexual behavior. The second one would be sexual self-identification. The third one would be sexual attraction. And the fourth one would be sexual arousal. These four phenomena, they can be in line with each other, but they aren't always. Um, we have many examples of people who identify as heterosexual and still engage into homosexual behavior, for example. Uh, for my project, we are, we are focusing on individuals who identify as non-heterosexual males. So it includes homosexuals, bisexuals, and pansexuals, and pansexuals, yes. Uh, Another important part of my project are the homosexual subcultures. So we have basically cultural niches of homosexual people and it, it makes clear how homosexual people are not an homogenous group as it was once considered in the scientific literature. So we have uh, many different groups who differ, who differ from each other into social rules, values, behaviors, stereotypes, and they have very different patterns of behavior and of their existence. They use very different drugs, for example. They have different patterns of sexual behavior. They have different appearances, and they, they go to different places. They behave differently. They have different personalities. And this is why I defend that the homosexual population is not as homogenous as it was once considered. So here I bring you some examples of the most famous subcultures we have in the homosexual community. 
We have bears, drag queens, twinks, uh, a bunch of fitness subcultures. There must be like five or six. Um, the suburbans, the activists, the alternatives, the leathermen, the daddies, the clubbers, the geeks and gamers, the BDSM practitioners, and the granolas. These are only a few examples. There, are, there is a huge list of potential subcultures. And unfortunately, we don't have time to be more detailed in each and every one of them. Another important part of my, my project are the biomarkers of sexuality. These are basically biological uh, traits that are much more frequent in non-heterosexual people than in heterosexual people. The three, oh, ah, yes. And these biomarkers might be markers of different developmental processes. These processes might be endocrinological, immunological, and genetic processes. And they seem to influence the type of homosexuality that will be expressed in the individual. There are studies already indicating, for example, that people who carry different biomarkers of sexuality express different, um, different traits re regarding masculinity and femininity, um, sexual preferences, especially when, re when it regards the penetrative role um, when people have to choose if they want to be a top or a bottom, it might, there might be a biological influence there. Choose between <laughs> many commas. Um, and gender conformity as well seems to have an influence on what type of biomarker these people carry. So the three types of biomarker of sexuality that I like to highlight for my project are the fraternal birth order, which basically describes the fact that homosexual men tend to have many more older brothers than heterosexual men. There is a long and complicated immunological theory called the maternal immunity theory behind it. So basically, each time a woman generates a male fetus in her womb, that, um, that, that environment of the womb changes for the next male fetus that will be generated there and enhances the chance that that fetus, when, when reaching a mature age, will not be heterosexual. The second one is handedness, which describes the fact that homosexual men tend to be much more left-handed than heterosexual men. And the third one is heritability, which describes the fact that homosexuality tends to cluster in families. So, going on to my objectives and hypotheses of the project. For your better understanding, I have divided the project into two phases. Phase one would be understanding the correlation between this, the belonging to different subcultures and the carrying of some psychological, social, and sexual traits. For example, sexual preferences, self-esteem, um, um, how people can relate and connect to the, LGBT, to the LGBT community. Um, what else? Social sexuality, which was mentioned in one of the previous talks. So we have selected some psycho, social, sexual, traits to correlate with the belonging to different subcultures in the first phase of the project. The second phase of the project will be correlating these two previous variables to the biomarkers. So I intend on separating my participants into four clusters according to the biomarker that they carry or to the absence of any biomarker whatsoever and try to see if the carrying of different biomarkers may be able to predict any other of these other two variables. The methods for my, for my project. So we are looking for male people over 18, um, identifying as non-heterosexual. And when I say male people, I mean both cisgender and transgender male people. Um, 
For the, pre for the preliminary analysis of my data, I have used the first 220 participants. So far, we have already more than 720 participants. Our goal is to reach 1,500 of participants. So we're halfway there. Uh, the instruments I'm using to collect this data is basically a battery of questionnaires and scales and inventories. One for social demographic information, one for sexual orientation information, one for uh, this gay peer crowd questionnaire is a questionnaire to index whether people belong or not to any of the subcultures that I'm studying. The revised social sexual orientation inventory is to study people's social sexuality. The childhood gender nonconformity scale to assess childhood gender nonconformity a self-esteem scale, and a masculinity slash femininity, femininity inventory. So these are the psychological, social, and sexual variables that I intend to analyze, together with the belonging to different subcultures and the carrying of different biomarkers. As I said, my project is still in a very preliminary phase, so I don't have many results to show you, but I will show you what I have so far. Uh, so I made a bunch of Pearson's correlation, a, a bunch of Pearson's correlations between all the variables that I'm studying so far. We, we have not found any significant variation, and therefore we haven't gone much further with the analysis of these tests so far. But since we have already tripled our, our sample, a, a new analysis of this data might already have a totally different face than this. Um, here I'm showing the face of the subcultures in terms of the psychological and social variables that I'm studying. So this one is separating the, par the, the participants according to the subculture they belong to, and these violin plots show their childhood, their childhood gender nonconformity. So the scientific literature says that a few of them should have should express more childhood gender nonconformity than the other ones. So far, we haven't found any statistical significance, but that's just the detail. So this is the same graphic, but for social sexuality. Um, the bears, for example, according to the to the, to the literature, should be one of the subcultures with the highest social sexuality. So far, we haven't found any significant differences but we still expect you. This is the same graphic, but for self-esteem. The same one for masculinity. And the same one for femininity. So, so far we cannot see any statistical differences between this, these subcultures. But as I said, our project is still at a very preliminary phases, and I have very high expectations for the future of the project. So I'd like to thank you, and if you have any questions, I'm all here for it. Você tem outro? Ah, tá aqui? Tem outro? Question, comment. One, two, three. Hi, uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, you mentioned something about uh, homosexual men and left handed. Yes. Um, there isn't something. Um, for that? I don't know. There are hypotheses. <laughs> so the hypothesis be be behind the biomarker of handedness is that there may be components that are common between the, the definition of a sexual orientation and the lateralization of the brain. So there might be components in common between these two processes that might um, create this correlation. But so far, it's just a hypothesis. There's not many data about it. 
Uh, first of all, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I would like to ask if your research, uh, the, uh, if you consider in, in when you're searching about gender and attraction, uh, about the, the construction between gender and, and the, the body, like uh, cisentrism. I, I don't know if you are familiar with this. I'm not sure you understand. I'm not sure I understand uh, the question. Like the construction of gender and attraction to the gender by itself and not the body that is considered um, like when, when you construct a gender. I'm sorry. Um, socially, the gender is seen as. Intrinsic to mm -hmm. the to the body in a in a general uh, in a general way. So, like when when someone try, when someone's transgender or non-binary, they tend to uh, the the prejudice tend to be about the 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 non-conforming body. So. The attraction is built up on the gender, but also on the body. Does your your study uh, see these questions as important, as relevant? I don't know. Are you talking about one of my first slides when I was defining sexual orientation? Yeah, and the methods. Now I understand. Um, well, a, a sexual attraction isn't really the main focus of the project. However, I'm not sure I, I'm not sure I believe that the gender is something intrinsic to the person. I tend to consider gender a social construct. Sexual orientation, however, seems to have a more solid biologic base. So I'm, I'm not trying to biologize gender. I'm just trying to biologize sexual, orient, sexual orientation. And as regard to transsexual people and non-binary people, uh, I think our times are changing faster than the scientific literature can keep up. And there's still a lot of data missing on these people. Um, transsexual males are basically invisible to the scientific literature. There's very few papers on them, for example. And however, I do consider that when people transition on their gender, uh, their behavior might or might not align with their gender identity or with their sexual, um, their, their, or with their, se their biological sex, depending on the case, depending on whether the person does or not um, hormone treatment. All of these factors can change a person's behavior. So it's a little more difficult to get there than we wish it were. Hi. Here. Uh. Um, about the biomarkers, mm -hmm. uh, it, it, does it apply to transgender men, trans men? No. Only. Uh, cisgender men and transgender woman, women. Mm. Yes, because a part of it seems to come from an interaction between the Y chromosome and the, 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 the mother's body. So you said you're considering trans men also in your research, so you have to, it's going to interfere. Yes, I do believe that uh, the, the participation of trans men in my research would be very useful, especially regarding the belonging to the, to the subcultures. Because we don't have uh, information about how these people interact with the subcultures yet. Okay, thank you. So I think this is where the trans men would be particularly important for my, for my research. My graduate student and I are looking at um, the really, I'm thinking of um, some additional biomarkers that you might consider 
my graduate student and I are looking at uh, anthropometric traits like grip strength that are highly sexually dimorphic and looking at the relationship between those traits and sexual behavior. Mm -hmm. And our interest is primarily in heterosexual, but just out of curiosity, we looked at the relationship between these traits and homosexual behavior. We do have, we have a nationally representative sample with um, I think about 5,000 uh, people in it, and we have about 50 to 100 homosexuals in the sample. And what we saw was that um, male homosexuals were shifted kind of in the female direction mm -hmm. anthropometrically, and female homosexuals were shifted in the male direction anthropometrically. And our sample sizes are probably too small for us to be confident enough this is real, but it's conceivable that might be another interesting biomarker are these highly sexually dimorphic traits uh, might somehow also be related to, to homosexual. Absolutely. Or, there yeah. are a few other um, biomarkers uh, in the literature. For example, the, the second to fourth finger ratio, the yeah. ratio between the sizes of the fingers. However, uh, since the instruments we're using for the project are basically questionnaires, we decided to focus on the biomarkers that would be possible to assess through these instruments. Right. So, for example, the, her the heritability of homosexuality can be as accessed through um, asking people if they know any other homosexuals in their families. I, I, I know this is not the perfect method, but it, it's how we're doing so far. And so that this, these are the biomarkers we're focusing on basically because they are the, 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 the most possible ones to be assessed through questionnaires and scales, which are our main instruments. This project was designed to be carried on uh, during the, the, the pandemics of COVID. So it was supposed to happen online. Right. Yeah, the, the data sets we're using are public and they've been conducted they're nationally representative, so, um, and they do have a lot of these anthropometrics and sexual behavior over many years, so there might be enough data in there for a new project at some later time. That, Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bruno. Thank you, everybody, for this very interesting day and presentations and discussions. And that's it for today. Don't forget to come tomorrow. And don't forget to come tonight for the banquet so that we can continue the discussions in a more uh, inofficial manner. So thank you very much again. It was very nice. <laughs>